Welcome back guys. Today we are going to talk about how you can become a Azure Solution Architect. Firstly, what does an Azure Solution Architect actually do and what are their responsibilities? You can find that in one of these videos that I'll leave your card above for or in the comment section below. Feel free to have a look at that. That'll break down what an Azure Architect does day to day and what their responsibilities are. I also have another video that is about an Azure Architect interview, the questions and answers that you might be asked. So feel free to have a look at that one as well. Today we're going to talk about how you can actually prepare or actually move into that Azure Solution Architect role and what you should do to start moving into that type of role and what type of certifications you need to do and what type of experience you should try and get. If you are enjoying these videos, if you do see some value, please make sure you hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. I'm trying to release a couple of these a week. So please let me know how I'm going in the comment section below and let me know what you'd like to see in the future. So let's just get straight into it. The first thing that I think you should do is read and study Microsoft Azure. So it's great if you can actually really understand all the resources and all the different types of things that are available in Microsoft Azure. Getting an understanding of how everything works through the Microsoft documentation or maybe through YouTube videos or maybe you can have a look at many of the other resources out there on the internet. There's lots of learning academies and whatnot that will teach you. I think that's where anyone should start. There is a difference between doing administration and being a sort of engineer in Microsoft Azure as there is to being an architect. Architect role really expects you to understand how everything works, how you can make it work together and how you can actually build a solution for your customer from scratch. So make sure you're reading, make sure you are studying, so have some sort of outline of the certification path that you would like to go on. I do have another video about certification paths if you want to have a look at that, I'll leave it in the comment section below. But basically you just need to have some sort of understanding of what you're studying for so that you can study all the right documentation. So book those certifications in, make sure that you have a path that you're looking for and also make sure that you are putting into practice what you are studying. So practice is my next point. Practice makes all the difference. I believe that you can be very strong as an architect when it comes to theory and when it comes to understanding what you are actually building but it's really important that you can actually implement it. There's a big difference between an architect that just is an architect and this happens a lot in the industry. A lot of people come in and they have all the certifications as an architect and they can build a great solution but us as the engineers or once they pass it on to the engineers maybe can't actually build what the architect is looking for. That's very common in IT. I think it makes a really big difference if you're an architect that also has an engineering background. So let's say for example that you have been looking at application gateways and you've been reading all the documentation for application gateways and you've been really trying to understand all the different type of switching and all the different type of rules that you can put in but you really just have an understanding of what it looks like and you really understand the theory but you haven't actually implemented one in Azure. It's very important that you go and actually try and implement these things but by building these solutions we really understand what those limitations can be. Sometimes there's limitations to the type of rewrite you can do or maybe the type of target you can have. These don't always get documented in Microsoft documentation. And a lot of these things you really learn by experience and by practice. So make sure you're practicing what you study and make sure you don't end up one of those architects that knows how to build a solution but wouldn't know how to implement it. That makes all the difference. You don't want to be one of those architects because what happens is you build solutions, you give them to engineers or you give them to customers and they fail to be implemented. And if it comes back because of due to a small limitation or something that you didn't pick up in the design, doesn't really look good. So I really suggest that you do thoroughly implement those solutions and really practice what you're studying. Okay, the next thing is understanding how on-premises environments talk to Microsoft Azure. It's really important as an architect that you understand what is a corresponding technology in Microsoft Azure as to on-premises. For example, a Netscaler or a application delivery controller can do content switching, it can do content redirecting, and it can do a few things that an application gateway can also do. Now as an architect, you might have a customer that comes to you one day and says, we want to replace all these services. And those services might be a mixture of services in their on-premises world. You need to be able to openly talk about what they can do to actually replace that environment. So you, if the customer wants to replace the whole thing, it's your job to actually go in and tell them what they can and can't replace and what they can replace it with. Now you don't always have to know on the spot, but it always looks good if you can talk to a customer up front and tell them how they can replace a service with a Microsoft Azure resource. So understand on-premises environments, 
understand Microsoft Azure and study how you can actually replace on-premises with Microsoft Azure because that's what you're going to be doing very often and also try and get a really good understanding of how they can interoperate. So understand how you can actually connect between the two environments, how data can flow between the two environments and that means having an understanding of connectivity so things like point to site, site to site and express routes. Those are all the type of different ways that you can connect and it's important for you to distinguish which way is the best way to meet your customer's solution requirements. Understand common architectures and reference architectures. So Microsoft have a good documentation library that has plenty of good known practices. I think they started to refer to them as good practice now, not best practice. So all your good practice reference architectures, you can find them in the Microsoft documentation. I suggest that you download them, you have a look at them, you understand them thoroughly, and then you even try and implement them if you can. Getting a good understanding of how a hub and spoke environment works in Microsoft Azure or how you can do a lift and shift or how you can segregate networks in Microsoft Azure, those are very important things because if a customer is looking to move into Microsoft Azure, they are often bound to these requirements. They have an environment on premises that has been around for many years and it's gone through lots of fine tuning. They don't want to move things into Microsoft Azure and lose that really good type of infrastructure setup that they have. They want to make sure that everything is set up the same way. So if they have a hub and spoke environment on premises, they also want to have a hub and spoke environment in Microsoft Azure. They've probably done it for a reason. They're probably segregating some subnets or some networking and they've created some exclusion zones for things. They want that same type of thing in Microsoft Azure. And if they don't, then it's your job to convince them that they should. And that's because usually what happens in Microsoft Azure is that people go in there with one or two things and then they just grow really fast and their footprint in Microsoft Azure tends to grow very quickly and it's often then that they come to an architect or a solution architect or a consultant and say that they have a larger Azure presence and that they would like to go back and fix it up and clean it up a bit and make sure there is a bit of compliance and governance. It's usually an afterthought. It's our job to show them the correct way to do things at the start of a project and if it's too late it's our job to fix. Understand what the costs are. So maybe if you have a customer that you're looking at doing some type of Azure work in or maybe if you don't, maybe if you just have customers that are all using VMware but you have an interest in Microsoft Azure, take it upon yourself to do a pricing exercise on moving all their environment into Microsoft Azure. So maybe do a spreadsheet, get the pricing calculator, the Azure pricing calculator, and see if you can actually build an estimate of how much it will cost to run the same environment in Microsoft Azure that they have in on-prem world. This is one of the first things that you'll do as an architect. You'll do lots of costing exercises and you'll help customers build solutions based on cost or you'll be given a budget and you'll be told to do a certain thing within a budget. It's really good if you get an understanding of the Azure pricing calculator. Anyone can go in there and play around with it. Anyone can go in and actually build a whole environment in there, including storage, including compute, including network. Everything can go in there and you can put lots of estimates in there and you can get yourself a really good understanding of how much something will cost. What I do say is be careful with the SKUs and T's that you choose when you're doing that pricing calculator. Make sure you are actually paying attention to that. Make sure that if you're using cool storage, then you're pricing for cool storage. Or if you're using hot storage, you're pricing for hot storage. Or if you're using a basic gateway or a standard gateway, make sure you're using the right thing because the costs can vary significantly. Especially if you're giving it to a customer, you don't want to do something like forget to add a SQL license when you are pricing up a VM. So if the SQL server needs a SQL license from Microsoft Azure, don't forget to add that in because that will really change the cost. Keep that in mind when you're doing pricing exercises. That's why I recommend that you practice doing them now before you become an architect. So by the time you are, then you have done a lot of these pricing exercises and you are an expert. All right, the next thing that I'll suggest is really understand compliance and governance. So understand how we can keep a tight framework around all the resources in Microsoft Azure and what Microsoft Azure does to help us keep those compliance frameworks in place. So for example, you can use Azure policy to stop people from creating certain resources in certain regions or to stop people creating certain resources in general. You can set a lot of type of restrictions that will help you in the future if you are with one of these customers that has these restrictions. So go in and practice things like Azure policy and also try and get an understanding of the policies that your customer is bound to. So until you're an architect, you're probably not going to be exposed to plenty of these things. So really try and learn and absorb what architects are actually doing. See if you can actually sit side by side with an Azure architect or see if you can actually do some research on the internet and find out what people are actually applying. It makes a big difference what country you live in as well. For example, I'm in Australia and I find that the compliance requirements and the frameworks that customers ask us to abide to 
differ a lot to America and Europe and whatnot. So I would suggest looking locally because you're going to be working for a company locally more than likely. Think about those type of things. In Australia, we look at data sovereignty a lot. That's part of the compliance requirements that a lot of the companies are bound to. So I would create an Azure policy that would restrict the customer from creating a certain type of resource or resources in general in a certain location. They'll only be allowed to create it in Australian regions. Understand those requirements. You don't have to understand them thoroughly. It's really important that you do have an understanding though that once you become an architect, you will have to understand some of these things. Not all of them, but some of them. There is always little limitations and little things that customers will tell you that they have to stick by. And I really strongly suggest that you actually start to do that now and start to learn it now because it might come as a shock later once you move into that architect role. I hope that helps. Good luck with getting into that Azure Solution Architect role. It is a great role. It's one of my favorite roles that I've had in IT. And if you are looking for anything in particular, please drop it in the comment section below and let me know. Otherwise, like and share the video and subscribe for more.